This conference will now be recorded. Okay, welcome everyone. Thanks for, thanks for joining us again. And we'll dive into um, achieving compact thermal management side meeting in SmallSat 2020. We are Advanced Cooling Technologies. Um, we are a small business and we're gonna jump right into the material here, but we do have some, some company background at the end that we'll uh, be sending out to everyone after the conference. Um, and if you could, please just uh, stay on mute as much as possible unless you have a, a question or, or need to bring something up. So today's topic, we're gonna talk about space thermal management and specific to um, small sets and, and cube sets and some of the other emerging um, space technologies. So in, in general, whether it's small sets or large sets, there's several um, large considerations needed for, for thermal design. So the first one, even similar to terrestrial systems, is it's heat rejection. You need to ultimately have a heat sink that's gonna reject your heat. In this case, in the, in the case of space where there's, there's no air, you need to <clears throat> rely on radiation to remove the heat effectively. So you need to um, have large enough radiators to dissipate the entire um, heat load that your satellite's generating. And based on the, the delta Ts of, of your ambient temperature and, and your component max temperature, you need to balance that to make sure you're gonna operate safely at all conditions. The, the next one highlighted here is, is where we'll spend most of the time today, and it's, it's thermal coupling. It's how to get the heat um, from your components to your, to your radiators. And we'll talk about various high thermal conductivity solutions there and some various solutions based on if you're transporting short distances versus long distances or need to um, store thermal energy. Uh, the next consideration is your orbital profile. So this kind of determines a lot of your boundary conditions within your system, but it's also, uh, it's usually a very good starting point from system level thermal design. So you wanna understand the orbital profile, you wanna understand your temperature extremes, and if you're operating only on a certain portion of that orbital profile, it could also give you some advantages um, to solve transient duty cycled operation versus steady state operation. So that's a, a big consideration you wanna understand and it really drives a lot of the thermal design, especially when you're looking to achieve very compact uh, thermal design. And then with anything that's going into space, um, mass and volume are of critical importance. So we want our, our thermal solution that, to uh, be as mass effective and, and volume effective as possible. So jumping into to heat pipes, um, for those of you who know what heat pipes are, how they operate, we'll, we'll just briefly touch on the theory behind them and then we'll talk about more of the, the space considerations. So a heat pipe is a two-phase liquid and vapor heat transfer device. And basically how it's gonna operate is you're gonna input heat to one area on the heat pipe, um, typically one of, one of the ends of the heat pipe, and it'll um, boil a fluid that's on the inside of the pipe. And that will create a pressure gradient inside that'll push that, that uh, fluid vapor to wherever it's colder in your system. And wherever it's colder, if you, it will condense back to a liquid and that'll get absorbed within the internal wick structure that lines the, the ID of the pipe. And that wick structure will passively, using capillary action, pump the fluid back to the, the heat input zone. So in, in very general sense, it's a passive solution. There's no moving parts. There's no active pumping capability. It's, it's a passive device and it provides very efficient heat transport based on the principles of, of two phase. So it uses the latent heat of vaporization to create that really high heat transfer coefficient at both the boiling and condensing surfaces. Um, and the fact that we pull a vacuum on the inside of the, the pipe allows these fluids, the, the various fluids we'll talk about, to operate across a very large range of temperatures. So when you have these temperature extremes in space, you can have um, a fluid that can, that can work across a, a large range of them and get that two-phase benefit across a lot, large range of them. So we'll start by talking about constant conductive heat pipes, which are kind of the trade name for aluminum ammonia heat pipes. And these have been used in space for, for decades. Uh, they're very versatile technology. They're typically used at the um, spacecraft level. So it's, it's when you're moving heat from your, your boxes, um, your bases to the radiator panels. And the big benefit here is one, ammonia is compatible with aluminum. 
So aluminum is a, a very traditionally used material in space industry, and it's also very lightweight. So you can have a lot of design flexibility by designing these into your system. You can use um, 2D and three-dimensional bends. Um, so it gives the designer of the spacecraft a lot of flexibility in, in how to incorporate these. And <clears throat> from, your, from your payload to your radiator, you have a very small thermal gradient. So it allows you to thermally couple those two, two zones with a very small delta T. Um, ACT, our, our cells, I mentioned these were, have been flying for, for decades in space. Um, we were founded in, in 2003 and we had our first launch in um, 2009. Um, since then, we've accumulated over 45 million hours on orbit with zero failures. So just again, this, this just kind of goes to show how reliable and proven this technology is for, for the space industry. And in terms of some of the design considerations, um, these pipes use an extruded um, grooved wick structure. So from, from a manufacturing standpoint, we, we can buy these, um, what you see at the top right there, extrusions that have various profiles. And then what we can do is machine away wherever you don't need the flange, again, allowing you to save weight throughout the system. But the, the groove structures do provide, the, the groove based wick structure provides the ability to transport uh, the fluid long distances. So that again, at the spacecraft level of design um, can move it meters in length. Um, we, we've developed heat pipes upward of 10, close to 20 feet in length. And um, it does give you a lot of design flexibility from that standpoint. One of the challenges with, with ammonia is the, the uh, surface tension property of ammonia itself. So that limits your ability to wick against gravity, um, which is critical for ground testing. You can't ground test uh, three-dimensional pipes because you can't wick the fluid like you can with, with some of the terrestrial pipes. Um, for those, we, we typically develop a test and we work with our customers to develop tests that um, either operate horizontally or um, a tenth of an inch adverse orientation. So that allows us to test it and prove it out in, a, in what we consider slightly harsher than a, than a zero G setting that you would see in space. One of the other uh, main limitations for aluminum ammonia heat pipes is the, is the heat flux limit. And for, for many years, you're, you're doing localized heat spreading with um, metallics and getting heat from your components out to the box and down to the base. And most of those designers are yeah, I'm, required. I'm just, are you watching the thing or something? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry? Could you please go on mute? Thing. And so that, that does limit the designers of those um, electronics and those boxes to make sure they have a surface that um, has, is being lower than a five to 10 watt per centimeter squared heat flux. And that's so the spacecraft level designers can take that heat out and away to the radiator panel. So it does create some um, localized challenging in terms of spreading, which is, which is why some of the other technologies are, are getting more involved. But, in terms of distance heat transport and um, ability to, to move and isothermalize radiator panels, um, ammonia is a, a very proven and, and very powerful technology. Um, you can see we do have a, a curve there to the right. This is showing a, a half inch diameter pipe. And the traditionally how we'll, we'll quantify the, the capability is in um, heat transport, which, which we'll um, refer to as watt inch. And then you can back calculate how much uh, wattage your, your heat pipe can move based on how long the pipe is. So we do have um, a standard amount of extrusions in our catalog. And if you're interested in that, if you're looking to design ammonia-based pipes into your system, um, feel free to email us afterwards. And, and we, we do offer our extrusion catalog, which are already developed extrusions proven out and, and flown in space. So we, we talked a little bit about um, ammonia pipes being used from, for getting heat from the components to the radiators. The other area they're really strong at is isothermalizing your radiator. So some of the traditional methods for, for radiator panels is using an aluminum honeycomb uh, with aluminum or composite face sheets. And that it, it's ideal for the space industry because it's, it's very lightweight and it's very strong. Um, so it, it's a nice combination there. Um, but what happens in a lot of these systems is you're, you're implementing heat at, at one point along that radiator panel. So you get basically a hot spot as you would on an air cooled ground uh, terrestrial heat sink. You get a hot spot and then you don't get the full effectiveness of, of your system. So with embedded, embedding ammonia pipes into these CCHP panels, 
you can take advantage of the entire um, surface area you have available that's being view space, and you can really increase the, the effectiveness of your radiator panel. So we can we have developed these and, and work with um, um, industry partners to, to deliver these types of embedded heat pipe panels. And again, it's a really nice lightweight solution that, that is a very, very effective for spreading out heat and taking full advantage of what your system volume has to offer. Um, just touching on some of the, the considerations there, um, bonding them into the, into the panel is um, you, you need some really, because of the <clears throat> materials that are in the, the composite face sheets or the aluminum face sheets, um, we typically do coat them to get a good adhesion surface. So we, we do have that ability as well. Um, and it's, um, yeah, it's a fairly straightforward process outside of that to uh, develop the heat pipes, making sure that we have um, good coverage across the panel and making sure we avoid all the structural members, inserts, and, and other various mechanical features that, that are essential to make sure your, your panel bonds to your spacecraft. Now we'll, uh, we'll shift gear a little. We, we talked about one of the limitations in the aluminum-based, uh, aluminum ammonia-based pipes as being heat flux. And that's why they're mainly used at the spacecraft level, um, taking heat long distances. But at the component level, you typically have a much higher heat flux. And there is a need, and a lot of the spacecraft industry is finding that um, this needs becoming more and more challenging as FPGAs and other components are, are really increasing their power densities. So what's been used on in terrestrial settings um, for, for many years is copper water-based pipes, which do have fairly high um, heat, heat flux limitations. They can operate upward of, of 50 watts per centimeter squared. Um, but the big challenge, is, as all of you know, in the spacecraft industry is um, what happens to the water when it freezes. And that's where, where ACT and some of our, our industry partners have been working um, the past um, almost five years on developing a repeatable manufacturing process and design technique to make sure that the water um, will not cause damage during that freeze cycle. And it's been proven in terrestrial applications for, for quite some time, but in those applications, you, you really only have the, you, you really understand where the fluid is at all times. So when you're transporting a heat pipe in, in your car or something and the temperature gets below zero, um, it'll freeze, but you'll understand and the, the wick structure can absorb that, that uh, expansion during the freeze process. In space, you have a lot of other considerations. You have almost instantaneous freezing because of the, the extreme temperatures there. You need to operate, um, you need to run power while the, the condenser is in a frozen state. So you need to run powered freeze thaw cycles and you need to start up when, when your heat pipe is frozen. So you have a lot of different considerations that could cause tiny bits of water to get where you don't want them in the system and ultimately cause, cause the, the pipe to rupture and, and then it would no longer function as a heat pipe. So what we've done over time is, is um, continually evolve the, the manufacturing process, um, looking at different seal techniques, um, different ways to insert the wick structure. And we've, we've developed over time with a lot of our partners a very um, consistent end product where we where have developed and passed these type of rigorous qualification tests. Um, so I, I know most of our, our projects are a little different, but the, um, the freeze thaw cycles are in the, in the hundreds, um, and we, we do routinely do um, performance tests before and after the, those various space reliability tests that you see there. So it, it has been proven. It can be done, um, and we're, we're encouraging the industry to, to think about this and consider this when you do have those high heat flux components because it is a really nice option to spread heat locally. Um, from point A to point B and spread out your heat so that, you know, your system level thermal management solutions can be more effective. And one of the, the ways we implement these, especially with small spacecraft, CubeSats and, and those types of things, is actually using um, embedded heat pipes as a portion of the radiator panel. So we can embed copper water heat pipes into aluminum. We'll, we'll nickel plate the aluminum, press the pipes in, and then we can, we can even do a secondary machining so you have a nice smooth surface on both sides for, for mounting components. Um, and this is used not only on like the sidewall radiators, but it's also used as board level spreaders. And what it does is it gets you really high thermal conductivity without um, any real structural or weight penalty. So the structural strength and the weight um, is very similar to what your aluminum would be without the heat pipes but you get about three to five times the thermal conductivity. 
Um, so this is a, a really nice nice technique for, for spacecraft designers looking to spread heat along a board, move heat out to the edges, or even to be used as their radiator panels themselves if they have some point loads and want to use aluminum as their, as their radiators. Um, this here is an example of the plate you saw on the previous slide. So in, in this case, this was a terrestrial application, but the, the customer had multiple hotspots. You can see there to the, the left image. Um, and basically, we need to strategically lay in the heat pipe so that we took those out to the, the uh, rails, which was tied into a liquid cool system. So you can see on the, on the top of the image, it was just a matter of getting the heat out to the sidewalls as quick as possible. So we used um, straight heat pipes to get the heat out. And on the bottom, you can see it wasn't as long of a thermal path, but the key there was to lower the heat flux into, into the cold rail. So we used some um, routing so that we had a long condenser length of, across that, that uh, cold rail, and we're able to, to drive down those temperatures as well. So those are some of the things as you get into your, your heat map, your component layout, um, how we can come in and strategically lay in heat pipes and, and get the most of your system. And in a lot of cases with these high K designs as well, um, because the heat pipes are doing all your thermal work, you don't need um, you don't need the metal itself to do any thermal work. So you can really just rely on the metal as, as whatever your structural component requirements are. So a lot of times you can thin those surfaces out and even add some um, weight reduction pockets into those as well. And just uh, kind of summarizing up the the difference between ammonia and uh, space copper water heat pipes. Um, the big one we covered was, was heat flux. So ammonia is, is, um, is less capable in terms of heat flux, uh, about five watts per centimeter squared, whereas space copper water are greater than 50 watts per centimeter squared. Um, the transport distance, ammonia is typically used for long distance heat transport, whereas space copper water is usually component level or board level heat transport or, or moving heat down a sidewall to, to your base. Um, the, the typical uses is, again, spacecraft level versus um, component level. And if you're looking at integrating into, into a, a panel or using a, the, the heat pipe as a panel, um, ammonia is typically integrated into aluminum honeycomb panels. That's a, a tried and proven. And then um, copper water heat pipes are usually integrated into solid aluminum um, for, for radiator panels. Um, the space heritage, we, we talked about ammonia, very proven, high space heritage. Space copper water, on the under, other hand, is really just emerging as these components um, are increasing their heat density. So we're really starting to scratch the surface of what they can do and how we can reliably launch them over and over again in, in space environments. Um, in terms of shipping considerations, that's one thing we didn't touch on the ammonia, but they they are considered hazmat because of the ammonia, so we do require x-ray and, and some other shipping considerations, whereas water is uh, pretty, pretty straightforward. And you can see some of the designs on the bottom there. Um, the left and the left two are ammonia-based heat pipes. The only difference is the left one is um, has a chem film gold coating on it, and the, the right two are um, <clears throat> embedded heat pipe plates. So those are um, a standard 6U and a standard 4U card that uh, has heat pipe strategically embedded based on where the, where the components were in that system. And before we move away from heat pipes, we did just wanna, wanna talk to, um, there are a lot of different options in heat pipes. We're, we're focusing actually only on a, a small temperature range here. We, we actually manufacture liquid metal heat pipes up to 800,000 degrees C. Um, but in the, in the space realm, these are your typical fluids. So we talked at, at length about ammonia and water, and rightfully so, they, the, uh, the merit number as we're characterizing here is a um, pretty well-known heat pipe um, number that, that kind of predicts performance based on fluid properties um, predominantly. And water and ammonia for their temperature ranges are, are kind of at the, the peak production there. And if you're looking at lower temperature ranges, um, ethane has, has been used as well. And methanol also provides a, a less capable option um, in, in the water sense if, if you're looking for um, component level cooling, but you, you don't want to uh, worry about anything freezing. Um, you won't get the performance you will with water, but uh, methanol is an option there as well. And 
basically both technologies we were talking about fall into the constant conductance realm. So you're, you're moving, uh, you're transporting heat and you're basically operating isothermal across the length of the heat pipe. In a variable conductance heat pipe, you're actually, um, you're actually adding a non-condensable gas into the pipe. And what it will do is it'll, it will shut down some of the condenser area. So normally you want to make sure there is absolutely nothing. Um, it's, your pipe is completely evacuated. Nothing's in there except for the, the fluid charge itself. But in this case, by introducing a non-condensable gas, you can actually better control temperature at your evaporator. So in the um, highest power condition, you're going to push all that non-condensable gas into a reservoir, and you're going to take advantage of your full active condenser range. So that would be coupled to a radiator panel or what have you. And during your lower power range, um, that, that non-condensable gas will, will creep up and it'll shut down a portion of your, your condenser. And what this allows you to do is control the temperature at your evaporator range over, over varying powers and also varying ambient conditions. And this is important, especially for like um, exploratory missions in space because heater power is so critical. So you don't wanna have survival heater power um, for, for your heat pipes, your electronics to, to keep them safe and operating. So you want to maintain that evaporator temperature at a relatively constant, constant rate. So variable conductance heat pipes can be, can be used for that sense. And the last technology we just wanted to tease here, um, and we can go into much more detail if, if you, you have interest, uh, feel free to connect with us afterwards, but is a, a 3D printed loop heat pipe. So this is a, a project we've been um, working, our, our research and development team have been working on for a couple of years, and it's basically looking to um, more steadily and repeatedly develop um, loop heat pipe evaporator bodies um, in a much more time efficient fashion. So if, if you're familiar with, with loop heat pipes, um, they have a fairly complex um, evaporator body from both a design and manufacturing standpoint but they do provide significant performance. So loop heat pipes can, can pump um, well, uh, very, very long distances. They can also operate on the ground. They can pump against gravity very well, um, and they can move significant amount of heat upward of one kilowatt um, can, can be done with, with loop heat pipe evaporator bodies. Um, so there is kind of a need, but the, the industry has been kind of moving away from them because they are, are so complex, um, difficult to manufacture, and the qualification and acceptance testing are, are very critical that they often become scheduled or, or priced out of projects. So what we've been working on is a, is a 3D printed loop heat pipe, which takes a lot of the same principles and, and scales it down in, into, well, into a design that we can 3D print. Um, but because we can 3D print it, we can make them much quicker. Um, it, it's a little more less complex. And we have shown very good results to date. So we have been able to um, transport over 125 watts and we've been utilizing very low startup power and very low heat leak has been um, during these tests and you can see the test set up there to the right. So again, we're, we're in kind of the development stage of this technology. If you have interest and want to learn more, please contact us afterwards, but this is another area where um, we could add some benefits to the small fat, fat industry because um, similar to loop heat pipes, these would have all their pumping capability done within the evaporator body. So it allows you to have flexible links within your system. So that's another big advantage if you are increasing your, your CubeSat or SmallSat power, you need to go to deployable radiators. It gives you that option and flexibility going forward. And just to um, really quickly, we, we a lot of times um, as, as the, the CubeSat industry and the embedded computing industry is somewhat overlap in, in terms of, of technology. Um, and standardization with, with the sizing and everything, um, we, we oftentimes relate them from a thermal perspective as well. So whereas on, on ground-based systems, we have products um, on the kind of board level spreading heat to the, the outside of the chassis. At the chassis level where we develop um, full high K or liquid cooled chassis as well as bolt-on um, heat spreaders. Um, but one area we wanted to touch on outside of the, the heat pipe area is our ice lock product line. That's what you can see um, in the top left image there. So ISOC stands for isothermal card edge. And basically what it's doing is in your systems where you have a 
a three U or six U car that you're sliding in and you're using a mechanical retainer or a wedge lock to hold that component in place, you are you're essentially relying on that, that mechanical joint to also provide some type of thermal link to your chassis. And in that thermal link, um, you can see the figure on the left here. You're basically creating two different paths. One, the, the wedge lock is pressing the board down directly to the chassis. So one path is directly from the board out to the chassis. And then the other path is, is through the wedge lock itself. And through that, it's a fairly torturous thermal path. So you have to go through various metal to metal interfaces, um, dry interfaces, and then through, through the chassis itself. So basically what ends up happening in these systems is you have about 70 to 80% of your heat that gets dumped straight from the board to the chassis and only about 20 to 30% that goes upward through the wedge lock. So what ACT did is we developed um, our ice lock design and it uses a different contact angle. So when you um, initiate the, the screw that pressures the wedges together, it expands in all directions. So now you have contact points um, on the lip of your board, both on the, the bottom and side lip of your board, as well as an additional chassis contact point as well. And in each case, you're not actually required to go through the metal to metal interfaces related to the ice lock. You're going through one wedge only. So you're, you're going directly from the side of the board through one wedge out to the top, similar out to the side, and then you still have that board to chassis on the bottom. So all in all, we've um, we developed a um, quarter inch and three eighth inch series of these products, and we've, we've tested them against kind of the, the standard wedge locks that are commercially available. And we've been seeing about a 30 to 40% improvement. So if your design does have, um, does have thermal bottlenecks at, at that interface, this might be a nice, uh, quick, easy to implement solution to, to erase those bottlenecks. And then the uh, last technology we want to talk about is uh, phase change material technology. So this is one that has um, has been kind of growing in the in the space industry and especially in the small fat industry because of some of the cyclic power loading in, in your in your system. So anytime you have an orbital profile that that might only have power pulsing when you're at a certain location relative to the Earth, or if you just have um, short-term electronic operation. Anytime you have that duty cycle where you're on off, phase change material can be implemented and um, could offer a volume and mass savings in your system. So the way it operates, if you look at the figure at the top right, is again, taking advantage of, of two phase, in this case being solid to liquid phase transition. Um, what, what phase change material does is during that phase transition, it takes advantage of the, the latent heat effusion of the material. And basically it takes um, much more thermal energy during that phase transition to rise temperature than it would when it's completely solid or completely liquid. So during that phase transition, you can actually absorb energy over a period of time until you completely transition from solid to liquid. And that allows you um, to have a lot of flexibility in your, in your external design. Um, but the other nice benefit of it is we're using um, very readily available materials, typically paraffin wax um, based materials. So they're very readily available and um, easy to process and e easy to manufacture with. Um, the, the biggest challenge with PCM is that all these materials have very low thermal conductivity. So the internal both structure and um, thermal considerations are important in these designs, but that's, that's something that we've done routinely is develop these type of, of PCM heat sinks, making sure that the the internal characteristics are such that it would not um, have thermal runaway during the melt. You're going to get 100% melt before you start um, having a localized hotspot. But again, a, a very passive, uh, reliable design for long-term operation if it's um, developed and manufactured properly. So when, when do you use it in the space? We covered that, a lot of short duration applications or, or duty cycle on-off operation. And why would you use it? The, the benefits, again, reliable, reliable and passive, but also the uh, weight and volume savings you can achieve with it. So just considering your, your spacecraft in, in uh, general, your, as we talked about, your entire goal is to get the heat out to the radiator panels and dissipate it to deep space. 
Um, and those radiator panels need to be sized for, for your entire thermal load. What the phase change material allows you to do is if you have duty cycle operation, you can size your radiator panel for average heat load because the, the phase change material, because of its um, melting and, and refreezing, is going to absorb those transients and it's going to dampen out that heat load. So again, you can, you can size your radiator for average heat load and get the, the volume and mass savings that, that come across that, especially if you have really high pulses in your system. And um, before we wrap up, we wanted to get into one, one case study. Um, we, do, we did something similar in a, in a 2018 webinar, so if you joined us for that, you might see some, some similar slides here. But um, yeah, this is a CubeSat application that was generating over one kilowatt of, of power. And they had a bunch of components that were each generating over 25 uh, watts per centimeter squared. And we, we, knew, we knew the components layout, we knew the max case temperature of those components, and we knew their operating cycle. So we knew it was um, 30 seconds on and then 30 minutes off operation. Um, the CubeSat dimensions were, were it was a 6U CubeSat, so roughly 12 centimeters by 24 by 36 centimeters. And ultimately, we need to get all the heat rejected through aluminum sidewalls of those dimensions. So, you know, running through that very quick, but um, I think the, the things you probably picked up on are it's extremely high power for, for a CubeSat. So um, likely, it's, it's going to be a challenge to get that much radiator volume available within those dimensions. Um, you likely picked up that there is some duty cycle in there and a, a fairly substantial one. So 30 seconds on and 30 minutes off does give you a lot of flexibility in utilizing PCM as, as a method to store that energy. And the third one is um, maybe a, a little less um, intuitive to pick up on, but was the, the heat flux. So the heat flux was too high for ammonia-based heat pipes, but falls right in the range with, with um, space copper water heat pipes. So those, those considerations, you kind of understand the, the technology selection, and then it's a matter of designing and incorporating into your system. So in this example, uh, the first kind of design consideration was, was the total, total power and duty cycle. So we wanted to size our, our phase change material that it could absorb that entire energy. So we, <clears throat> we basically take those two characteristics and figure out how much volume of, of PCM we need in the system. Um, from there, it becomes a packaging problem for the PCM and a transport problem thermally. So it's a, it's a matter of putting PCM wherever you have enough volume to, to house it. And then based on those locations, how are we gonna get the heat there and how are we gonna spread the heat throughout the PCM? Because as I mentioned, PCM has a very low thermal conductivity. So in this design, what we did is we, we um, sized the PCM and then we found there was enough volume directly over the components and within um, the sidewalls of the radiators that we're able to implement PCM where you see kind of these internal fins um, were used to help melt the PCM. And then from there, we, we developed some heat pipes that were able to take the heat out to the, to the PCM surfaces and ultimately the radiator surfaces. And so this one, we actually ran some, some kind of subsystem and system level design and analysis. Um, so you can see some of the the subsystem, the thermal system, um, CFD analysis there, where we, we figured out the melt front of the PCM, um, ran the simulation over, over the, both the transients and, and steady state operation. And we're, we also did the sizing of the heat pipes to make sure the heat pipes were, none of the heat pipes would fail. So it was a, a kind of a nice design because it kept you fairly modular and you were able to take advantage of all your sidewalls um, and able to move heat around. And ultimately, we were able, with margin, to, to maintain that under that 75 degree case temperature. And with that, I, we, again, we'll send this uh, presentation out and we'll post the recording. But we do have several resources here as you're considering these um, systems. The heat pipe calculator, the first one listed here, is an online design tool. It's posted on our website. It's a free calculator to use. And this actually helps you size copper water heat pipes. Um, so this will, will, will output um, basically your transport curve, how much power you can move at various temperatures and different diameters. So it's a really nice um, first order tool. And if you're close, you know, you can contact us and we can help uh, progress you over the finish line here. Um, we also have a phase change material calculator. 
same, same idea. It's using um, some high-level principles on how to size PCM, giving you a couple options based on various melt temperatures. And again, if you're close to your size and weight, there's usually some optimization we can do. So if you, if you get close using those calculators, come to us and, and again, we can help push you over the finish line. Um, and then a couple others, we have the reliability guide available online that talks about some of the, the extreme testing that, that our heat pipes have gone through. Um, and then we do have the CCHP catalog, basically the extrusion for the ammonia um, <clears throat> constant conductance heat pipe. That's available upon request. Get in contact with us afterwards. And um, yeah, it, it is proprietary. So if we get an NDA in place, we'd be happy to share that with you as well. And I will include my contact information. Feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, be happy to answer any questions. And also I, I will kind of promote if, if we, we went through everything at a fairly high level here. So if there is interest in going into more specifics in one technology or a couple of technologies, we'd be, we'd be happy to host a kind of a more personalized um, learning session with, with your team of engineers if, if there's a specific interest. So please reach out and we'd be happy to organize something more in depth. And with that, I just had a couple of background slides. These will all be within the package that goes out, but talked a little bit about ACT and our capabilities. I won't go into detail here since we're already at 40 minutes past the hour. Um, we'll, we'll hand it over to Q&A, but um, just our, our very quick plug. Uh, we, are, <clears throat> we are a growing company, a small business in Lancaster, PA. We work very heavily collaboratively with, um, with companies, engineering teams to develop, design, spacecraft level um, solutions. So we, we take on everything from, from system level design analysis to very specific heat pipe design analysis. Um, and we'd be happy to partner with you if you have a really challenging thermal, um, thermal challenge that's going on space or, or even on the ground, please reach out. We, we'd be happy to work with you. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll pass it over We've had a couple of people monitoring the chat box for, for question and answer, or if uh, you would just like to, to jump in and, um, and ask a question, we'd be happy to take it now. I have a question. Uh, it's George Fleischman. Uh, do you have any issues with the uh, CTE mismatch between copper and aluminum? Uh, excellent question. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Jens Wyatt speaking. I'm the manager here at ACT for our Defense Aerospace Products Group. Um, so to answer that question, I'd say no. We have not seen issues uh, with the CTE to date. So we make quite a number of uh, copper water heat pipe assemblies for terrestrial applications, uh, orders of magnitude more than in space. And I would say in both, we have not seen any issues. As part of the manufacturing process for the copper water heat pipes, they go through a sintering operation, which uh, essentially anneals the pipe. So it has a, it's very ductile, and we see that it basically goes along for the ride um, with the CT of, of aluminum. Hello, this is uh, Felipe Colasso, if I can ask a question. From uh, sure. Goddard Space Flight Center. All right, so we work with um, cryogenic systems. Uh, so this goes along with what the gentleman just asked. Uh, with CT mismatch, we have um, cryomech coolers, and they're two cycles, and we go down to three Kelvin, and then we have ADRs that go down to about 40 millikelvins, and we usually have um, heat dissipation troubles at that at that uh, temperature. Have you guys done any work uh, at that? particular temperature um, and the second are... thing is um, do you guys do custom custom pipings so if I send you a model uh, can you guys uh, you know generate a small model for a CubeSat uh, 3U a CubeSat thank you sure so uh, I'll start with the, the second part of that question is the easier one to answer uh, yes we do make a custom tubing um, and welding if needed so we do have the AWS D171 certified welders here. Now if you need any fittings or uh, bimetallics, anything like that, welded onto your tubing assemblies, uh, we'd be happy to do that for you. So if you want to send over uh, prints or sketches, uh, we can certainly take a look at it 
and see, see how we can help you. Um, regarding the first part of your question, I would say our experience is a little bit more limited here. Uh, we have done some work uh, with cryogenics uh, with our R&D team, and we have done some work with ethane-based uh, CCHPs. Um, but for the most part, we're dealing in the, the minus 40 and up type uh, temperature ranges. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I have one. Uh, this is Eric Gallier at NASA Goddard. Have you any applications for um, electric propulsion systems? So regarding electric propulsion systems directly, I don't think we have a product, we don't have a product specifically for that. However, if you do have a thermal management issue with that system, uh, I'm sure we we can help you out with it. So we do have the heat pipes in, that cover basically all temperature ranges from cryogenics to the more common uh, CCHPs and copper water heat pipes, as well as liquid metal heat pipes to get into much higher temperature ranges. So if there is a, a thermal challenge that you're seeing, uh, we'd certainly be interested in talking, talking to you more about it. Okay, thank you. Sure. Hello, this is Anil Atalori from Penn State Harrisburg. I have a question on the dimensions, like what is the smallest the sizes of these heat pipes or custom heat pipes you can create? Sure. So uh, probably on the smaller side, we would uh, consider the copper water-based heat pipes. Uh, routinely, we make them down to the three millimeter uh, diameter and maybe a few inches in length. Um, pushing the, the boundaries there, the smallest we've ever made, I think, is around the 16th diameter. But at that point, you're really not moving a whole lot of power. Um, on the aluminum and ammonia side, uh, typically, a three-eighths diameter is is the smallest you see there. Any experience of using these things in a kind of RF environment, radio frequency, or MRI environments? Sure. Yeah. So we do have uh, quite a number of products on uh, medical equipment, including MRI and TT scanners. So uh, yes. Um, these technologies can be used in that environment, and in some of those applications, they see uh, some high G loading because of the, the rotational as aspects of it. Mm -hmm. um, so overall, the answer is yes. Uh, these technologies can be applied there. Are there any resources which we can look into for this one, or if we can share that one in the chat, or that would be great. Uh, perhaps if you want to reach out to Brian or myself, um, we can get a little bit more background information about your specific application. We can uh, see what we yeah, can pull together and, and show. That sounds you. great. The dimensions you mentioned were IDs, the 116 diameter and 1/8. Uh, those are outside diameters. Okay. Well, so what is your inner diameter? So you make you make the wall, you know. One sixteenth of an inch thick, or or something like this. It might be on the order of uh, thirty thousandths of an inch or so. Um, again, that that was a very unique application. I probably recommend staying in the three millimeter above diameter. That's what we have uh, posted on our calculator on the website, so you can see how much power they're actually moving uh, for the respective diameters. Excellent. Thank you. Sure.
we do have time for one more if anyone wants to uh, ask a final question here. So I did get one uh, on the chat box uh, I can address if no one has uh, anything else to mention over the phone. Um, the question was, uh, Brian, you mentioned a catalog. Are your heat pipes off the shelf items? So uh, regarding our catalog, we do have some standard extrusions that we use for the aluminum and ammonia pipes. And we can design those uh, cross sections into, into your system, select the right diameter needed to move the power uh, and what makes sense uh, for the geometry. Now, the rest of our offerings are custom. So we have the standard technologies, but each application is a little bit different. So we, we do custom tailor those to your needs. Uh, we can do build to print services, but we do find that when we work with you from the beginning, uh, support the design and analysis effort, we find that uh, we can really help identify the right technology for the right application and work the thermal management system from the, from the source to the sink. And um, getting involved early is always preferred. Sometimes thermal is an afterthought. So if we can get involved uh, when needed, um, we're, we're more than happy to do so. Excellent. Well, we'll, uh, we'll cut out there. I want to thank Yen for uh, managing the, the Q&A there and thank the, uh, the small set and uh, attendees for, for joining us here today. Uh, hopefully you got something useful out of this. Uh, feel free to reach out if you have any further questions. We'd be happy to, to work with you or partner with you on, on some of the more advanced uh, thermal designs you're, you're seeking. And enjoy the, uh, the rest of small set and we look forward to seeing, hearing, and working with everyone in the future. Thanks a lot. Thank you, guys.